Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 621, and today is June 24th, 2024. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anslone. A lot of news to get through on today's show. It was a busy weekend over at antiwar.com, so you're definitely not going to want to miss this episode. And if you can, go ahead and hit the share button. If you're a new listener, hit the subscribe button. Of course, the show is hosted at the Libertarian Institute. We reprint the show on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video version of the show. It's up anywhere you can listen to audio podcasts. And of course, follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anslone underscore. And that is the best place to keep up on all the articles I write, all the podcasts I put out, as well as any other podcast appearances I do. Uh, some big ones oh, last week and then this coming week. Last week I was on with our old friend Alan Mosley and then also Robbie Bernstein, who does Run Your Mouth. And then on Friday I was the guest on the Tom Woods Show which was a huge honor. Tom has been a major influence on me. And so to have a chance to be on his show and to talk to Tom was a really great experience. I think the show came out absolute excellent. So if you want to check that out, I have it posted on the blog at antiwar.com or at um, the Libertarian Institute. And of course, it's all over my social media. And with that, let's, oh, and I'm on Judge Napolitano's show Monday, June 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you can, catch it live. If not, watch after. Let's get into it today. All right, so first story up here. Hundreds injured in Crimea. Russia says Ukraine used American missiles. So the Russian Health Ministry reports that five people were killed and over 100 injured by a Ukrainian missile barrage in Crimea. Moscow claimed American cluster munitions were used in the attack. On Saturday, Sunday, Russian civilians in Crimea were hit with debris and cluster munitions from a Ukrainian attack. Uh, this is from the Russian health minister. According to the latest reports, as a result of the shelling attack on Sevastopol by Ukrainian nationalists, 124 people, including 27 children, received wounds or injuries. The Russian news agency TASS reported that five American-made attackums with cluster munitions were used in the attack. Moscow claims it downed four of the missiles and a fifth exploded over Sevastopol. And again, all we really have here is the Russian reporting. I, I just want to highlight that it's possible that they shut all shot all of them down and that with one or multiple, uh, the cluster munitions still spilled out over the city. There are some videos of what appears to be a beach in Sevastopol where, uh, you know, Russians are out there relaxing, having a good time. And suddenly the people are fleeing the beach. It, it isn't clear to me if you know, it's potentially the debris from one of the shot down missiles or uh, the, the actual one that exploded uh, and, and dropped its munitions What was dropped over that beach area there. So so that's unclear. I see a lot of, you know, more pro-Russian accounts saying that this was a attack on a beach. Not so sure that's the case, but the Russian defense ministry said the U.S. is responsible for the attack because of its role of helping Ukraine fire attack on missiles. Uh, the ministry statement said all flight missions for the American attack operational tactical missiles are entered by American specialists based on U.S. satellite reconnaissance data. Therefore, responsibility for the deliberate missile attack on civilians in Sevastopol lies primarily with Washington, which supplied these weapons to Ukraine, as well as the Kiev regime from whose territory the attack was launched. The statement added that such actions will not go unanswered. The Kremlin, Kremlin labeled the attack an act of terrorism. Kiev claims that the Crimean Peninsula is Ukrainian territory, but Russia has had full control over the region since Moscow annexed it in 2014. The U.S. greenlit Ukraine to attack Russian territory, including Crimea. The U.S. recently expanded to allow Kiev to hit targets inside of Russian territory within 100 kilometers, or 62 miles, of Kiev's Sumy and Kharkiv oblast. However, 
Kiev is still seeking broader authorization from the U.S. on the range and weapons it can use to hit targets inside of Russia. A Ukrainian defense official told the Washington Post neither the range nor the category of weapons is sufficient. The New York Times previously reported that restrictions on Ukraine's use of U.S. weapons were in place in part of Biden's plans to avoid World War III. But throughout the war, U.S. and NATO countries have taken escalations they previously ruled out due to fear of provoking Russia. Still, Kiev is asking Washington to further provoke Moscow by sending more advanced weapons systems. Ukrainian President Zelensky said Saturday, modern air defense systems for Ukraine, such as Patriots, accelerated training for our pilots for F-16s, and most importantly, sufficient range for our weapons are truly necessary. So it doesn't seem like we're going to get a reduction in the escalation anytime soon. I expect major responses from the Kremlin this week. Uh, this is going to definitely include a lot of bombing of Ukraine. I'm not sure if they're going to look to take any other actions against American or Western targets elsewhere in the world, maybe through proxies or something like that. Uh, Definitely something to keep an eye on in, in the coming weeks. All right, next up here, this one from June 20th, antiwar.com. U.S. to give Ukraine priority access to new air defense interceptors. So the U.S. will try to surge um, missile defense weapons into Ukraine by giving Kiev priority access to new production, Washington will take Patriot and Namus interceptors intended for other allies and ship them to the war-torn state. According to the Wall Street Journal, President Biden informed allies that their shipments of air defense munitions would be delayed as Kiev prior will be prioritized over the next 16 months. The outlet says that South Korea and the UAE are expected to be most impacted by the move. Now, this came around the same time that Netanyahu started complaining about Israel being restricted in the number of weapons that they were getting. So I did a little research, and Israel does not use the Namas system, and they do use Patriots, but they are in the process of phasing them out for other Israeli air defense systems. So I'm not so sure that Netanyahu is actually concerned about this at all. Um, so the decision comes as Kiev is struggling to defend its cities, troops, and critical infrastructure from Russian missiles and bombs. The AP report viewing satellite imagery shows Russia has stepped up its attacks on Ukrainian cities in recent months. Which is, of course, Moscow's response to the, you know, Ukraine stepping up attacks on targets inside of Russia, particularly energy infrastructure, uh, which the U.S. told Ukraine not to do, and Kiev went ahead and did it anyways. While the U.S. plans to send Ukraine interceptors for Patriot and Namas air defense systems, Kiev is hoping to receive launchers and radars as well. President Zelensky has requested additional seven Patriot systems, but only Romania has agreed to send one. RTS, formerly Raytheon, mates Patriots and is the former employer of U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Patriots are the most expensive interceptor in the American arsenal, with the system carrying a billion dollar price tag and each interceptor costing the U.S. $4, billion, or $4 million. Although Washington has urged Kiev to curtail attacks on Russian energy infrastructure to avoid Moscow's retaliation in kind, Ukraine continues to strike its neighbor's oil refineries. On Wednesday, a Ukrainian defense official said Kiev had successfully set fire to an oil refinery in southern Russia using a drone raid. All right, next up here, U.S. supported route to become Next, NATO Secretary General, and uh, I wrote this one for Antiwar.com on June 24th. So this is Dutch Prime Minister Mark Root, R-U-T-T-E, I hope I'm saying his name correctly, and he will become the Net Secretary General of the North Atlantic Alliance. The White House backed his ascension to become NATO's top civilian official. Root will replace outgoing Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. In his bid for the job, Rutt has secured support from all 32 member states and is expected to officially take over at the NATO summit in Washington next month. Uh, 
He has served as the Dutch Prime Minister for 14 years, but last year announced plans to step down. Hungary was the last holdout for Rutte. Prime Minister Viktor Orban said Budapest threw its support behind him after he pledged that Hungary would not have to support the alliance's proxy war in Ukraine. So Orban posted on ads, I am aware of the outcome of talks between Yen Stoltenberg and you, that's Rutt, regarding NATO support for Ukraine. It is my understanding that you stress that no Hungarian personnel would take part in these activities and no Hungarian funds will be used to support them. During a 2018 press conference, Rutt interrupted when then-President Donald Trump was speaking to disagree with him. Gordon Soundland, who served as Trump's envoy to the European Union at the time, told Politico that Rutt had a history with him of pushing back when he thinks Trump is wrong, and he does it straight to his face. Soundland noted that Trump did not like Rutt, despite their clashing views. This well in support for Rutt comes in part because Western leaders believe he will be able to push towards push Trump towards continuing the proxy war in Ukraine. However, Brussels has failed to implement any concrete Trump-proofing policies. Fabrice Poither, who served as former NATO Secretary General Angus von Gramusen's policy chief, says she does not believe Rutt's appointment would be enough to stop Trump from ending the war in Ukraine. I just think Skeptical that Trump-proofing NATO and Trump-proofing the transatlantic relationship will do the trick. Trump and some people around him won't be tricked a second time. And I thought that was a huge quote that she made there. That Trump and the people around him will not be tricked a second time. Because what does that admit? That you tricked him the first time. And why is that important? Because the American people elected Trump who was running on a policy of getting along better with Russia. And so if Trump was tricked by the North Atlantic Alliance, then the will of the American people was deceived and uh, circumvented by the North Atlantic Alliance. We pay billions of dollars to keep the North Atlantic Alliance afloat, and it is now being used to deceive us and to undermine the policies that the American people want. And, And more on Trump in a second here. So on the campaign trail, Trump has pledged to end fighting in Ukraine without presenting a concrete plan for doing so. When he ran as president for 2016, he discussed withdrawing from NATO and approving U.S.-Russian ties, calling the bloc obsolete. However, during his term, the relationship between Moscow and Washington significantly deteriorated, and Trump began shipping weapons to Ukraine. And it's easy to blame this all on Russiagate, and that does certainly play a big role in it. When Trump tried to meet with President Putin, CNN was writing articles speculating that Vladimir Putin had hit a secret listening device in a soccer ball and was now going to be in control of Trump somehow, or that Trump had promised, uh, you know, Putin things in a closed door meeting, and that this had possibly amounted to treason that Trump would even speak with Putin. And so, In that sense, there was a lot of political pressure that was completely invented by the the liberal end of the American spectrum that did a lot of damage to the U.S.-Russian relationship, and in part because they believed their own lies when Trump was president, by the time Biden took over, they're all prepared and ginned up for a war against Russia and Ukraine, and that's certainly what happened. However, when we talk about the significant deterioration of the relationship uh, between Moscow and Washington, during Trump's administration, it would be a real mistake not to blame Trump for a lot of it because a lot had to do with the destruction of the INF Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, and the economic war that Trump started and the weapons that Trump shipped to Ukraine. All those things were new policies that Trump implemented that significantly ratcheted up tensions between Russia and the West and set the stage for Biden taking office, saying that Ukraine was going to become a member of NATO and provoking the Russian invasion. Trump is 100% you know, responsible for the path that led us to the, the current place we are in in the world on the brink of World War III. So I include, include the article here. Rutt is replacing Jens Stoltenberg, who has been in the role for a decade. On Thursday, the Romanian president, Klaus Ioannis, the only challenger to Rutt, dropped out of contention. Two U.S. officials said Washington was pleased with Ionis's when he cleared the way for Rutt. So 
That is um, pretty interesting. Next up here, Trump Farage say NATO provoked Ukraine in invasion through expansion so i wrote this one for antiwar.com june 23rd former president donald trump said that ukraine's membership in the nato alliance was a major provocation for moscow and part of the reason the russian president vladimir putin ordered the invasion of the country trump's remarks were echoed by nigel farage a far uh, um, not far a right-wing populist in the uk in an interview on the All In podcast, and one of the hosts of that is David Satz, Trump said he was willing to take NATO expansion to Ukraine off the table. For 20 years, I heard that NATO, if Ukraine goes into NATO, it's a real problem for Russia. I've heard that for a long time, and I think that's really why the war started, he said. Trump argued that President Biden provoked the war by pledging Ukraine would join NATO. Trump additionally expressed the war in Ukraine would not have happened under his administration because he would have kept oil prices lower, and Putin has relied on high energy costs to fuel his war machine. Now, I think Trump maybe overstates a little bit about his policy of keeping the price of oil lower, but I do think that he is kind of in the realm here of something that I have talked about on this show, which is if the U.S. really wanted to, it might actually have been possible to just isolate Russia. Now, it, it would have been difficult in 2022, but... Assuming the U.S. had spent the entire period since the end of the Cold War of waging economic war against Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Zimbabwe, Cuba, North Korea, China, you know, there's probably four or five other countries I could add to that list. Then when we try to isolate Russia, there's not all these ready and willing partners to jump on board with, a, 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 you know, kind of the Brits community, an economic community in the world who's willing to work outside of the U.S. financial system. But because all of our sanctions over the years had really prime the cre creation of this alternate world economy that once 2022 happened and we went to sanction and isolate Russia, immediately they find plenty of other trading partners because the world was primed for that. Additionally, the sanctions that Trump put on both Iran and Venezuela took a significant amount of energy oil off the world market. And I think that also played a pretty large role in priming the, the increase in, in oil prices that has allowed Putin to sell Russian oil at such a high cost and continue to do pretty well with the Russian economy. So Nigel Farage, who is the leader of the Populist Reform UK party, expressed a similar view on the war in an interview with the BBC. He explained, I stood up in the European Parliament in 2014 and said, there will be a war in Ukraine. Why did I say that? It was obvious to me that the ever eastward expansion of NATO and the European Union was giving the main reason to say they're coming for us again and we go and to go to war. Farage added, we provoked this war. Of course, it's Putin's fault. He used what we've done as an excuse. His Reform UK party could potentially lead the opposition against the Labour government after UK's July election. However, Trump, who is often labeled a critic of the war in Ukraine, did endorse escalations by American European partners for the proxy war. When answering a host's question, the former president ple pledged not to send American soldiers to Ukraine, but went on to say it was a different issue for France and Germany, who he says should be doing more to be involved in the conflict. Trump said... It's different for France. You know, their neighbors, more or less, we have an ocean in between us and Ukraine. The It's different for Germany, although Germany is much less involved than they should be. One of the things I think is unfair, I think it's terrible that we're probably given at least $100 billion more than Europe. And so two points here. And one, I think, is the first that this points the fundamental flaw of what Trump's doing here is he really doesn't understand the game being played, right? If French troops end up in Ukraine and French troops start dying, the political pressure is likely going to be so high for the alliance to escalate that America is ultimately going to get drug into the war. Additionally, you know, he's talking about European countries need to spend more on this war. The problem isn't that they need to spend more. America needs to 
to spend less. And so if Trump is saying that France is a neighbor of Russia, and that's why France has to send troops to Ukraine, but Germany, which is significantly closer to, to, to Russia than France is, isn't that interested, then, you know, why isn't Trump looking at a map and saying that, oh, the French are so concerned because they're neighbors, but Germany closer isn't as concerned, huh, I wonder why this is, maybe it has more to do with policies in Paris and Berlin than actually the the issues at hand here and additionally if the you if you know trump comes into office and rather than actually ending the war decides that what needs to happen is that the europeans need to spend as much as the americans on this war then it's going to significantly escalate not de-escalate and end the war as he's promised and i just note here at the end for several weeks french president emmanuel marcon has been working with kiev on a plan that will see french troops as well as other forces from NATO countries deployed to Ukraine to train Ukrainian soldiers. Russia has warned those troops will become targets. All right. Next up, getting into some news on Gaza here. This June 20th, antiwar.com, Netanyahu's aides warned him not to post video attacking the U.S. The strife between the White House and Tel Aviv could have been avoided if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu listened to his aides who instructed him not to post a video attacking the Biden administration, according to a senior Israeli official. On Tuesday, so this was almost a week ago now, Netanyahu published a video on ETS that slammed the White House for blocking military aid transfers to Ukraine. Netanyahu said, when Secretary Blinken was recently here in Israel, we had a candid conversation. I said I deeply appreciate the support the U.S. has given Ukraine from the beginning of the war, but I also said something else. I said it is inconceivable that in the past few months, the administration has also been withholding weapons and ammunition to Israel. The Biden administration's response has been a mixture of anger and confusion. The White House suspended one strategic summit between the U.S. and Israeli officials about Iran, but business between Washington and Tel Aviv remar largely remains unchanged. High-level means between the U.S. and Israeli officials are expected in coming days, and I believe Sullivan already met with his Israeli counterpart, and Yoav Gallant is now in the U.S., and he will be meeting with Lloyd Austin, our Secretary of Defense, today. Several U.S. officials say they are perplexed by Netanyahu's remarks because U.S. weapons are flowing to Israel at the normal pace, with the exception of one 2,000-pound bomb shipment that the White House says is under review. Netanyahu appears to have taken the White House's uh, mild response. John Kirby said the video was disappointing and vet scene. He said, I, it's hard to know what went through him. The video was puzzling, to say the least. So Netanyahu said, I am ready to suffer personal attacks provided that Israel receives the U.S. ammunition it needs in the war for its existence. And this seems to be kind of an interesting political tactic where Netanyahu is pretending that the White House is somehow attacking him and he's somehow acting as um, some kind of sacrifice to get Israel the weapons it needs. I, I really don't think that's the case. Now, we do have some more information on this finally after a week. This one from Will Porter at Antiwar.com, June 23rd. U.S. no longer fast-tracking weapons to Israel. The Joe Biden administration recently ended a policy which it expedited arms transfers to Tel Aviv, a U.S. official told the Times of Israel. The comments came after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu accused the U.S. of withholding lethal aid amid the months-long onslaught in Gaza. The unnamed American official revealed the policy shipped to the Times of Israel on Sunday, explaining that while the U.S. weapons are currently being set at the, quote, normal pace, Biden scaled back the fast trash shipments that were more common earlier in the war in Gaza. In recent months, the U.S. resumed its normal procedures for tra weapons transfers, including various congressional organizations that outlet reported, noting that the decisions coincided with a slowdown in Israeli military operations in the Gaza Strip. According to Israel's Channel 12 News, around 240 separate weapons shipments were delivered to Israel in the first phase of the war. It noted that the transfers dropped to about half that figure in recent months. And so... 
The war's about 265 days old now, I think. So there's well over a shipment a day if those are the numbers, which, you know, is a huge, significant amount of weapons. The remarks uh, by the U.S. official follow allegations by Prime Minister Netanyahu that Washington has significantly held back arms transfers. First raised in a video post that he uh, put on ETS on Tuesday, he later elaborated on the claim during a wide-ranging interview with Punchbowl News founder Jade Sherman, arguing that the deliveries had slowed to a trickle. The White House later reacted to those statements with surprise, saying it was not clear what weapons then Yahoo was for referring to. Officials maintained that only one transfer of 2,000-pound bombs has been paused over fears of civilian casualties in the crowded city of Rock in the southern Gaza city, but said military aid was continuing at the normal pace. So far, the ongoing row has prompted the Biden administration to cancel a high-level strategic dialogue about Iran with Israeli officials last week, which has was intended to cover both pol- countries' policy towards Iran. It's also important to note that in March, Israel canceled that meeting because they were upset about UN Security Council vote. All right, next up here, this one about Yoav Gallant's trip to the U.S. I wrote for Antiwar.com on June 23rd. The Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant is traveling to the U.S. to discuss the next stage of the wars in Gaza and Lebanon. The U.S. is pushing for Tel Aviv to bring the conflicts to an end, while the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is demanding more weapons from the U.S. Before leaving for his visit to the U.S., Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant indicated that Tel Aviv may want to reduce operations in Gaza in preparation for a larger war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Since Israel began its onslaught in Gaza, Israeli forces have traded tit-for-tat attacks with the militant group. The fighting between Hezbollah and Israel has displaced hundreds of thousands, killed nearly 500 in Lebanon, and caused over two dozen deaths in Israel. So the defense chief said, We are prepared for any action that may be required in Gaza, Lebanon, and in more areas. The transition to phase C in Gaza is of great importance. I will discuss this transition with U.S. officials, how it may enable additional things, and I know we will achieve close cooperation with the U.S. on this issue as well. It is unclear when Israel plans to transition to the lower-intensity military operations in Gaza. Last week, Deputy to the U.S. President Amos Hoshtin told Lebanese leaders that major Israeli operations in Gaza would take five more weeks. So I guess we're looking at mid to late July or early August, if that timetable is at all correct, and the Israelis aren't just making it up. It could be that they scale down operations from 100% to 95% and claim that that's plan phase C, or it could be that phase C really does involve a scale down a military op maybe they couple carry out just a couple bombing operations across the strip every day or something like that it, or again it could be major military operations we really just don't have an idea at that point of uh, of what it means that they're going to engage in a lower intensity form of warfare in Gaza the only thing that seems clear is that they will transfer military units out of Gaza into the northern border it is unclear when Israel plans, um, oh, excuse me, the talks between Galat and his American counterpart, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, come amid a growing divide in Tel Aviv's and Washington's vision for the Middle East. The Biden administration is hoping that a ceasefire in Gaza will end the fighting along Israel's northern border as well. Meanwhile, some in Tel Aviv believe a transition to a lower scale operation in the Strip will allow Israeli forces to be relocated to the north to fight Hezbollah. The White House appears to be attempting to deter Israeli leadership from pursuing this course. On Thursday, CNN reported speaking with three U.S. officials who said the Biden administration believes Hezbollah is capable of overwhelming Tel Aviv's air defense systems. Still, Hochstein told the Lebanese prime minister that the U.S. would aid Israel's war should hostilities significantly escalate. However, Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to say he is unhappy with the supply of weapons he is receiving from the U.S. Um, 
Over the weekend, White House officials told top Israelis visiting the U.S. that Washington would provide Tel Aviv with security assistance should war with Hezbollah break out. Galan's visit to the U.S. comes weeks after an international criminal court prosecutor, that's Kareem Khan, requested an arrest warrant for the Israeli defense minister and prime minister for war crimes committed in Gaza. And of course, Netanyahu will be in here a couple weeks himself uh, to address Congress. All right, next up here, Netanyahu, Israel to scale down operations in Gaza, quote, very soon. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu claimed that the intense phase of the Israeli operations in Gaza will end very soon. However, he said Tel Aviv was not moving off his war footing and would redeploy his forces to the northern border to fight Hezbollah. In an interview with Israel's Channel 14 News, Netanyahu explained how Tel Aviv's plans to manage his multi-front war. In regards to Gaza, he said major operations would end sometime in the near future, but stress he is not willing to end the war and leave Hamas as it is. Once operations are scaled back in Gaza, Netanyahu stated he would redeploy Israel's military forces to its northern border. After the intense phase is finished, we will have the possibility to remove part of the forces to the north, and we will do this first and foremost for defensive purposes, and secondly, bring our evacuated residents home. If we can do this, we will do this diplomatically. If not, we will do it another way, but we will bring the residents home. So chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Charles Q. Brown, warned that Iran could get involved if Israel and Hezbollah engage in a major war. Tehran would be more inclined to support Hezbollah, uh, he said, adding particularly if they felt Hezbollah was being significantly threatened. Over the past eight months, Israel has ruthlessly bombed Gaza daily, killing more than 37,000 Palestinians. I did read this weekend that the number of dead plus missing is now over 50,000, and the number of missing is expected to be essentially a death count. Most of those bodies are dead and buried under the rubber, maybe uh, rubble. Maybe some have been held by Israel. Uh, of course, they, they may be killed in the Israeli detention facility, uh, but they may just be receiving torture rather than actually being dead. Um, the IDF has dropped 70,000 tons of bombs on the Strip, destroying most of the territory's civilian infrastructure while forcing nearly all Palestinians to flee their homes. The sale of the destruction has triggered a massive humanitarian crisis with nearly 1 million people facing famine. And uh, on that now, war deprives Palestinian children of food, water, and education. A UN official recently described the Israeli onslaught in Gaza as a, quote, war on children as Palestinian youth go without food, education, and many other foundational needs. The spokesperson for the UN aid agency for children, that's UNICEF, and his name is James Elder, said in an interview with Democracy Now! that Israeli military operations in Gaza amount to a war on children. He said he was recently in Gaza and attempted to deliver aid to children, but their trucks were turned back at an Israeli checkpoint. He also said he witnessed an Israeli war crime during his time in Gaza. Elder explained that Palestinians were fishing from the Gaza coastline for hours before Israeli forces unexpectedly opened fire. He reported seeing two men lying wounded on the beach, and Israeli forces refused international aid workers the ability to provide medical care. Elder said he later examined the bodies and saw the men were shot in their nets and back. The situation for the Palestinian children is becoming more challenging in the heat of the Gazan summer. Elder said that dehydration is a growing issue, and the sweltering conditions add to the psychological toll on children. The physical and psychological exhaustion they face is almost impossible to capture, the UNICEF spokesperson said. I've seen videos of, of this, and this is something um, from my time working in a therapy school. I have seen children who have suffered severe trauma and were, um, I don't want to say actively suicidal, but were, you know, in the, in the process of considering suicide and um, just, you know, how damaging it and the kind of what would seem to be strange things that they do, but, you know, really are 
their their attempts to express the the the, the suffering they feel. And so I've seen videos of Palestinian children uh, burying themselves in, in like sand on the beach, and you know, not as a fun and game, but to say, you know, they they want to see what it feels like when they're going to be buried beneath the ground, or what it would feel like if their their house of rubble collapsed on top of them. Um, there was another UN official, or not a UN official, this was actually a reporter for CNN who talked to some parents across the Gaza Strip, and uh, he, he she uh, talked to one mother who had a, a young seven-year-old, and that seven-year-old told, told you know his mother and the reporter that basically he has nightmares of seeing his beheaded little sister's body. And, um, you, you know, he just wakes up screaming and terrified all the time. I, I mean, the, the terror and then what's going on with these children, how, you know, they just talk about wanting to die and how it would be better to die at this point is, is really heartbreaking to see. And, um, you know, it's because not only of the war, not only the bombing, but of course, I'm sure the lack of food, water, and nutrition is impacting the kids, not only like uh, cognitive development, but also cognitive function abilities in the present moment as well. And you making it harder to, to process what's going on around them, but also just the constant lack of food, nutrition, education, anything that would resemble a normal life, right? Kids don't wake up every day and go to school and guys that they wake up every day. They look for food. They look for water. They look for shelter. They're forced to be displaced to get, uh, you, you know, the, the suffering for these children is really just unimaginable. So the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu claims the Strip is receiving an ample amount of food and other assistance. However, aid agencies say the aid is crossing into Gaza it is just a small fraction of what is needed. They describe it as a drop in the ocean. And this was a really interesting, really disgusting remark that Netanyahu made in his interview with Punchbowl News. But it seems to be a larger piece of propaganda that Israel and their supporters in America are, are trying to put out and that is Israel is letting in enough food in Gaza there's not a real famine in Gaza this is all just manufactured and the, the people of Gaza are really doing fine and to the extent that there is problems with food water etc it's really all the fault of Hamas and so Netanyahu says the Israeli government has calculated they've allowed in 3,200 calories, so 3,200 calories per each person in Gaza per day uh, over the past eight months. I have no idea how he calculates this. I, I doubt it's accurate. However, you, you know, one of the things that we pointed out is just because the uh, food is, quote, entering Gaza doesn't mean it's really getting to the people. There's uh, thousands of tons of food that are held at and around the U.S. pier in Gaza. It's been able to enter through the pier, but from the pier, it hasn't been able to get to the people. So it's just being held by Israel. A lot of the airdrops that the U.S. has, has uh, car carried out over Gaza, some have landed in areas controlled by the Israeli military. That's not gained to the people. Uh, we've seen Israelis open fire on people trying to get to these aid shipments. And so some of that may have gone to waste just since sitting there rotting because people felt it was too dangerous to receive. Uh, some of it has floated into the ocean. Israel has shelled not only the aid convoys themselves, but also warehouses and things like that. So that's destroyed a lot of the aid. And additionally, I think there's been hundreds maybe of trucks that have now entered Gaza and South Gaza in the recent weeks. But it's really only crossed the border crossing and it hasn't been able to trans transit into where the, the Palestinian people in Gaza actually are because of the Israeli fighting on the ground. They can't establish safe routes and everything like that. And the reason I thought Netanyahu's calorie comment was so interesting is because there is a comment about Gaza in general that, that the Israelis uh, have kind of relied on for some time, and they called it putting the Palestinians on a diet. I believe this was released by WikiLeaks, and they said that they actually count the calories of what is getting into the people of Gaza, and they try to keep the number just above a starvation level because they don't want uh, people to see video of kids starving to death because then people would demand more aid under Gaza, but... They also don't want the Palestinians well off, and so they, they keep them what they call on a diet, just uh, very disgusting. So 
Additionally, the chaos on the ground in Gaza makes it difficult to move aid throughout the Strip, even if it makes it inside the border. The Israeli Defense Forces said they opened an aid route in the southern half of the Gaza Strip where shipments are piling up. The groups responsible for distributing the aid say the Israeli military in operations in Rafah have made it too difficult and dangerous to operate. The lack of food and fighting has led to st the starvation of at least five children so far in June. Human rights groups and the UN predict that one one million Gazans are already or near a state of famine. And when we say that the five children that have started to death, that's what's been documented in Rafa. There were 3,200 children that were receiving uh, these daily ultra nutrition supplements because they were either acute or severely malnourished or moderate or severe malnourishment was the state there. And you can't just, you know, start even a little bit of peanut butter. Then you have to eat uh, kind of specific nutrients and, and go through like a, a phase to get your body what, what it needs. And without that care, some of these children may also be starving to death and they just may not be counted because their parents have been displaced and, and there's no hospital or anywhere for them to even like really bring their child's body to at this point. So, this is uh, this is from the Fuse Network, the Famine Early Warning Systems Network. It's a U.S.-based uh, agency. Regardless of whether or not of famine, IPC five, five thresholds have been definitively reached and seeded. People are dying of hunger-related causes across Gaza. Acute malnutrition among children is extremely high, and this will result in irreversible psychological impacts. Beyond food, Gaza's children are in desperate need of clean water. The UN Human Rights Office assesses that two-thirds of Gaza's water and sanitation systems have been destroyed. So Dr. Ahmed Al-Fari, the head of the Children's Department at Al-Nasser Hospital, says it's no secret that the biggest cause of intestinal infections are currently occurring in the Gaza Strip is the contamination of water supplied to these children. The first problem is intestinal infections with vomiting and diarrhea, which causes dehydration. The second problem is hepatitis C or A, which there are are no less dangerous than intestinal infections, if not more so. The children in Gaza have gone without education and a severe lack of medical care over the past eight months. 69% of Gaza schools have been damaged or destroyed, and its hospitals have seen their beds for patients shrink by 70%. All right, a couple of quick stories on October 7th here to wrap up with the first one from Will Porter. Israel's top court suspends October 7th probe. And so there's two probes here, or multiple probes going on in Israel. You had one that was organized that the IDF did not support, and the Israeli high court shut this one down. Now you have a second probe that's being conducted by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and I covered that one in this article for antiwar.com. IDF report found multiple cases of friendly fire deaths on October 7th. A review by the Israeli Defense Forces set to be released this summer will conclude that Israeli soldiers killed many of their own people on October 7th, Israeli media reported. The inquiry is expected to identify multiple failures of the IDF during the Hamas rampage in southern Israel. According to Israel's Channel 12 News, the IDF is report is scheduled to be released mid-July and found many casualties due to our forces firing on our forces. Tel Aviv has been accused of ordering its soldiers to kill hostages rather than allow Hamas to use them in negotiations, a policy known as the Hannibal Directive. The IDF October 7th review appears to point to incompetence rather than intentional killing of its own civilians. However, Israel's Ynet investigation of the IDF conduct found Tel Aviv had ordered troops to follow the Hannibal policy. Still, the conclusions from the forthcoming report will amount to an official admission that scores, if not more, of Israelis were killed by the IDF soldiers and not Hamas on October 7th. On that day, Hamas launched a large-scale assault on southern Israel that killed hundreds of attackers, 776 Israeli civilians, and 776 members of the Israeli security forces. The Jerusalem Post recently reported that many of the Israeli deaths were caused by IDF overreactions or inaction. 
So this is from J-Post. According to the report, the probe will find numerous cases of friendly fire errors leading to tragic deaths. Groups of IDF soldiers who were too hesitant to confront Hamas invasors as others rushed to fight without formally being summoned. Higher up commanders ordering some groups of soldiers to remain in reserve second line capacity when they should have been headed to the front and not knowing how to handle complex battlefield questions involving a hostage. And so, again, you know, this is really trying to point to incompetence and not intentional issuing of the Hannibal directive. Uh, we will see once this report comes out the, the real details and we'll go through it at that time. So while Tel Aviv has denied that the Hannibal directive was put into effect and it says it is no longer used, evidence has emerged of Israeli forces firing on homes, knowing civilians were inside. One incident at Kibbutz Berry killed 12 Israeli civilians. There are multiple probes investigating the IDF's actions on October 7th. The one Israeli government-led inquiry was shut down by the country's top court this week amid objections from the IDF and numerous senior officials. Oh, I do have one more article here. Very important one. <laughs> Sorry to save it for the end. Report, Israeli officials say no movement in Hamas talks. This one from Will Porter, Antiwar.com. Negotiations to end Israel's month-long war in Gaza have all but reached a standstill and still unnamed senior Israeli official told a local media outlet the comments came after Hamas's political le leadership expressed a desire to continue dialogue. Speaking to Israel's Channel 12 on Saturday, the high-ranking official reportedly voiced pessimism about the ongoing talks, saying that negotiators are unable to convey the idea to Hamas that there will be no better deal than the one already proposed by Israel. We have reached a situation where there is no movement. Israel has gone as far as it could go. President Joe Biden has adopted the proposal. The United Nations Security Council voted on a proposal for Israel to stop the war, they said, adding that there was no longer any room for additional discussions. While the officials blamed Hamas for the impasse, the Israeli government has made contradictory statements about a multi-stage ceasefire plan announced by President Biden in May, which was alleged to have the support of Tel Aviv. Mere hours after Biden unveiled the proposal, however, the office of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a statement that appeared at odds with what the U.S. president had just announced. It insists that any deal must allow Israel to continue in the war until all of its objectives are achieved, including the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities. Hamas's eradication was not provided for in the U.S. bad peace plan, which instead called for an immediate pause to fighting until the warring parties could hammer out a more permanent ceasefire. During that time, Hamas and Israel would also negotiate a prisoner swap, and Israeli forces would later withdraw from Gaza entirely if the talks achieved progress. More recently, the Israeli Prime Minister suggested that Gaza missions would soon shift to a lower-intensity operation, but nonetheless declared he was not willing to end the war and leave Hamas as it is. On Friday, Hamas's political bureau, Ismail Hyena, said the group was still willing to reach a deal to end the war, although he went on to stress that its main conditions, a lasting ceasefire, prisoner exchanges, as well as the reconstruction in Gaza and additional humanitarian aid are uh, you know, still core conditions of his. So he said, Hamas is open to engaging with any proposal or initiative that secures the foundations of Palestinian resistance position in a ceasefire negotiations in the Gaza Strip. Despite the obstacles, international mediators have also continued to voice hopes for an agreement with the Qatari prime minister telling reporters on Friday that Doha and Cairo were working to bridge the gap between the two sides. He cautioned that no final framework has been accepted, however. Efforts are continuing but so far we have not reached a formula that we feel is most appropriate and the closest to what has been presented. As soon as this is done, we will communicate it to the Israeli side to try to bridge the gap and reach an agreement as quickly as possible, the Qatari leader said. All right, everybody, that will do it for today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, I'm on with the judge today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. If you can, tune in and check that out. If not, watch it after. Thank you all so much for uh, listening to the show and follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anselone underscore.